Hello and welcome to Programming Like It's 1979, although in this case we're actually moving into the 1980s a little bit to talk about um, a game, a thing, a programming project called Chipwits. Uh, with me I have Doug Sharp, one of the developers of Chipwits, and Mark Roth, uh, one of the developers of Chipwits The Next Generation, I guess we can call it, right? Um, let me tell you my introduction to Chipwits, and then I'm going to try and get out of the way and, and probably let you talk a little bit about it, Doug. I okay. w went to uh, school in 1986, and there was one kid in 1986, I shouldn't say kid, college student, freshman, who had a Mac. They existed, but they were rare. Most people didn't have their own computers. A few nerds had them. Most of us worked in the computer labs. And he showed me Chipwits, was his pride and joy, and I spent hours in his room completely obsessed with the game. Um, wow. I, I think of it as a game. Do, would you describe yeah. it as such? It's a game. It's a, it's a game with a big hook, which is programming, which we know is is a lot of fun and, and uh, you know, can be treated as a game. So, yep, it's, it's, it's a game that teaches programming. How did you and Mike Johnston, the other developer, um, mm -hmm. come up with the concept for it? Were you inspired by anything that had come before? Well, of course. I mean, you know, Rocky's Boots was inspiring. Um, we didn't want to follow it. We wanted to be in the same arena. And it was, you know, like I said, it was inspiring to see somebody do a, a really high quality commercial game about programming. And um, we we spent about an, an, a year earning money to buy time to do Chipwits. Um, and during that time, uh, we knew we were saving up to do our own game. And we kept came, coming back to the robot thing, we called it. <laughs> and uh, yep, and, and from there, we, we uh, were able to buy time uh, with our with our bankroll and we dove right into it. 84, we bought a Mac as soon as we saw the Mac, we knew it was perfect for chiplets. We had been thinking about the Apple too, but uh, just loved the Mac. And, and so we, we aimed right at the Mac uh, from the time we got serious about the game and uh, had it out in time for Christmas, which was, you know, you had to hit it in 84 um, or you, you wouldn't make any money for the year. So, so. One of the things that really stuck out to me, and, and you actually triggered this, you wrote a blog article, I'll put a link to it right here, um, about how you wrote Chip Wits in a variant of fourth. Yes. And that there was some discussion of the language itself. Maybe the, the programming language should be fourth related. And that made me think of Silas Warner's game. I can never, I've covered it. I've done a video on it. I can never oh. remember if there's Robot War and there's Robo War. I think Silas Warner's was Robot War. The thing that really jumped out at me about Chipwits at the time is this was a game about programming robots that was not primarily about fighting. Yep. Yep. Um, we, we both came from educational backgrounds and we wanted it to be in schools. That was very important to us. And, and so uh, we aimed for fun goals and, you know, uh, th that worked out. And, uh, you know, it's, it's fun to, to watch that grow into the current game and, and keep that same sense of fun. And everyone likes eating pie. At the end of the day, <laughs> yeah. buy coffee. Can't argue with buying coffee. No. And um, I don't know if you know that, but uh, uh, Mark also played uh, Chipwits in in the eighties. Mark, do you want to tell us a little bit about your Chipwits uh, experience? And and I think also it's probably a good time to mention. I don't think we've said it in this interview yet. Part of why we're talking is the two of you are rebooting Chipwits. In 2023, we are yes, uh, and so excited to be helping with that. Uh, you know, Chipwits was a real inspiration for me personally. Uh, I got my first computer when I was five years old. It was a Commodore 64. Uh, still remember the first time I turned it on and 
you know, uh, what I love about the Commodore is that as soon as you turn it on, you're coding, right? You have no choice, <laughs> even to load a game disc, you know, or, or a tape, you know, a cassette tape, you, you write a little bit of code. And, um, you know, to me, that's always what computers have been about. And that was actually what has always been fun about computers is the coding part. And, um, you know, from, from day one and, um, my first exposure to chiplets was in my fifth grade class. Uh, my uh, teacher at the time had a Commodore 64 in the back corner of the room, uh, and we would play "Where in the World Is Carmen San Diego" and things like that. And uh, but you know, after school one day, he said, "Mark, I, I think you might like this game I've been playing." And he he loaded it up, and I was immediately just hooked on it. And you know, I, I asked him that day, like, "Can I borrow it?" You know. And I, and I took it home and I loaded it up. You know, we, we bought our own copy eventually because I, I was just, you know, so uh, hooked on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I guess what hooked me on it is just that, um, well, it's a game about coding. And, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a fun game about coding. And, you know, you're programming robots. What could be cooler than that, especially as, as a kid in fifth grade, right? So, uh, yeah, that, that was my first exposure to the game. And it's an immensely influential game even in ways that go completely unacknowledged. Uh, one of the, the games that I, so I have a bit of a bee in my bonnet about programming games. A lot of the videos on my channel, uh, as my viewers either love or, or can't stand, are about programming games. And one of the ones I tracked down was a Japanese PlayStation game called Carnage Heart. Um, and Carnage Heart is chipwits. I mean, it's, it, the way you build uh, the programs, the way you, this this concept of we're going to have chips on a board and there's a true branch and a, fa a false branch and we're going to do layout and move the chips around. I mean that was that was really all you, Doug, wow. and, and you know wow. your partner uh, Mike. Yeah. And I think other people have have really taken that and and it's been influential. I think so. I've seen it cited in some. Um, scholarly papers about iconic languages, which, you know, uh, uh, always gives me a kick. So, yeah, but that's great. I'll have to look at Carnage Heart if you can uh, provide a link. That sure, I can. I, I will. Uh, I'll, I'll put a, a link to a wiki in the video and I will also send you yeah. something uh, offline as well. Okay. One of the things going through the Chipwitz manual, I, so I, I fired it up this week and, you know, <laughs> so decided to see like what was what was in my memory uh, and what was different. And one thing that I think I had not really internalized was very much in the spirit of its time, Chipwitz was really a sandbox, right? There weren't, yes, there was a score, right? As you pick up objects and stuff. Um, how, I, I, maybe this is a question for Mark, perhaps. How do you adapt that in 2023, the idea of a pure sandbox game, you know, even Minecraft is not a pure sandbox. There are, there are kind of modes with goals. How are you approaching that for the reboot? Yeah, I guess we could both cover this a little bit, but I'll, I'll give my perspective on it. Um, you know, it, it, there's a lot of things that we've been talking about, about how to properly reboot the game, um, because you, you do want to be um, true to its origins. Um, and we want to make sure that people who played the game will recognize it and identify with it. So, you know, we definitely want to keep enough of the character and the spirit and as much as possible the original game as we can. But we also have to acknowledge that modern audiences are very different from, you know, audiences that were playing the game, you know, in the 80s. And in particular, you know, games, you mentioned the manual, right? How many games do you buy now? Right where you, you mentioned a manual. <laughs> and, uh, but games used to be that way, right? You used to buy a manual and, or the, with the game, you know, we'd get the manual and um, sometimes even the copy protection would be, you know, turn to page seven and what's the third word in the fourth paragraph or whatever, right? So the manuals are very much part of the game, but today that's just not, you know, possible with, with the modern audience. And, you know, you, you have to hook them right away uh, they have to be interested right away because there's so much competing for people's attention. So, you know, one of the things we really want to do is just make the game very easy to approach, very easy to learn. Um, so one of the things we're doing is incorporating uh, uh, how, how to play the game 
into the game itself. So, you know, just basically adapting a tutorial, um, you know, in, into part of the game. Sure. Uh, so you don't need to pick up a manual. Right. Um, but we also want to balance that with the very open-ended nature of the game. So we've been talking about adding puzzles, but we want to balance that with open-ended missions that mm -hmm. people can just play and, and have fun with and set their own objectives and goals. You know, Chip, Chip Wits was never intended to be a puzzle game, you know, right. purely. Um, but, you know, we, we think that we can incorporate puzzle-like elements uh, in, into the game. Um, but yeah, I, I guess in terms of it being a sandbox, or I, I guess, what, what do you mean by sandbox? Do you mean as a simulation, as a... Uh, I mean, I mean, as an undirected activity, right? The, the, yes. the, the only real direction, and Doug, maybe this, this is a, a good thing for you to chime in on. The only real direction is you can maximize your score. Mm -hmm. But again, if we're calling back to the manual, even the manual is like, you should do what you want. You know, make your, ro uh, my first robot, which I don't know if this will make it into a video because it was very embarrassing as I learned how to use the conditionals in it, uh, was oh, I'm going to pick up coffee and nothing else, right? Like that, that was my goal. How, did, you, did you have a kind of vision at the time for what kind of robots you expected people to make? And also, did anyone make anything that truly surprised you? Um. There, okay, uh, a couple layers. We tried to give a feeling of the range of things you could do with the example chiplets that we shipped. I mean, one of them, Carusoid, all it did was sing. You know, it didn't do anything useful. And, uh, and crash into things, right? Crash yeah. into things and sing. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, we were trying to, to show the playfulness and the open-ended nature. I mean, uh, and I certainly heard from players who were who were making chip wits that just played in the mission that you know, and um, that was fun to hear. And of course, some surprising things were some of the solutions that people came up with to get the maximum scores. Uh, for example, there was one mission where you were hunting baddies. I mean, we do have a zapper on you know on. Uh, but, uh, and so um, it turned out that the, the optimal solution was to stand in a doorway and spin around. And as the, the baddies regenerated in each game, you just shot and mm. you kept spinning, and, you know, totally off the wall solution. But uh, once that was found, that, that, was, that was it. But the fun thing is, and, and it'll be interesting to see now that we're going to build a community is, in the past, people couldn't share their ideas about uh, chip wits. You know, there were people discovering these things for themselves. So it'll be interesting to see what'll happen when when uh, people can communicate about their chip wits. Yeah. One thing I wanted to, to make sure to mention, um, and hopefully I'm showing this as I'm talking about it, is the, the art style of chip wits was really, you know, quirky and kind of, clunky and beautiful you know i feel like we have a language for games right and people today in 2023 i think have accepted pixel art as uh -huh. like a particular style that like okay i didn't grow up with it but i recognize it and i know what it is minecraft has this particular visual look it's different from the pixel art but okay that's a minecraft style mm -hmm. chipwitz falls into this Uncanny Valley is the wrong term, but this early <laughs> Mac scene where like it was more detailed than what we would call, consider pixel art, but it was still black and white and it, and it was still comparatively primitive to things we saw by the, the mid 90s. Who drew, who, who came up with the concept for that chip? Wait, was that you? Was that Mark? Was it someone else? Or, and yeah, no, that was that was me. I, I, I have a, a notebook and I'm going to share this on the, the blog. Um, I, I kept a yellow legal pad. And so you see early sketches, uh, you know, three-legged things and uh, claws coming out of the face. Mm -hmm. uh, and then all of a sudden it just popped out the, the skates and the friendly little face and glasses and uh, the hatch. Uh, it, and I knew that was it right away. It's very uh, approachable. It really is. Uh -huh. And we're, we're keeping that spirit. I mean, we are upgrading the graphics significantly. 
but uh, it's it's a chip wit and it'll be you know uh, recognizably chip wits for sure. The, the 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 interesting thing to me is that chip wits does fall right on this border. So my first year of college, we used um, a, a system called Corel the Robot. By, it, was, it was Richard Pattis, who was a Berkeley professor, who made this, which was you programmed a robot in what amounts to Robo Pascal, right? Mm -hmm. And Corel is not a game. You're getting, there's assignments, you're being graded on them, make, make the robot navigate this maze and do a thing. And then mm -hmm. today you have um, these programming games like Manufactoria, I think would be the one that jumps to mind. And Chipwitz falls right in the middle of the transition. It's both an educational thing and a game. And how did the market of, was it 1984? 84. How, did, 80, how did 1984 yeah. receive this? We sold 20,000 copies, which was a reasonable, you yeah, know, that's... That, I mean, we appeared on, um, you know, uh, charts as with a rocket um, and um, it was very, it was a heady time, you know, to, to see Chip what's doing. I mean, we didn't make any money beyond the advances because publishers Welcome to publishing, yeah. Publish, yeah, very creative about expenses and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, the graphics were fun because I had to do three versions, the Mac, um, you know, black and white detailed. And then the, the Commodore was very much more pixelated and... Uh, you know, uh, uh, looked a little more primitive, but, but I, I had to do some machine, you know, like that was where I did the most machine language well, coding. So this is where, where I'm going to take a risk and I'm going to trust my audience that they will happily not only follow me into the weeds, but, but they'll be happy that I asked. So you have a blog article describing the use of, was it Macforth or Gra Interforth? Macforth, to write Chipwits. So that's, forth is, I mean, it's not a super high level language, but it's also not assembly language. Right. And the Mac is a machine. I think I saw Chipwits running on a 128K Mac. So, you know, it's not exactly a, a you know, a TI-99-4A. And then you're bringing it to the Commodore 64 <laughs> and I think eventually the, was was there an Apple II version? Did I imagine oh, yeah. that? Oh yeah, yeah. How how did tech from just a purely technical standpoint? You're not writing that in fourth on the Commodore sixty four. You're not writing that. Oh, yeah. In, oh yeah. I think uh, I missed that detail. Probably about seventy percent of the app of the Mac code um, trans transported ported, um, wow. and then you know the low level stuff graphics. I was um, but um, I. The way Mike and I earned money was porting games between the different, you know, we put, we ported probably 30 games from, you know, the Apple to the Atari ST and, you know, various. And so I had a very, I was experienced in, in being able to code for different machines. So I, I made, I made it easy to transport, you know, when I did the original. So, so, um, and um, now the current environment, uh, you, we're using Unity, and, and Mark can talk about that. What a, what a leap into the future. Yeah. Mark, do you want to give us some detail on your experience with Unity and on this project? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, actually picking the, the right game engine is is a topic we want to to post on in, in our blog in the future as well. Um, but yeah, uh, we, we considered various different things. Actually, when we when Doug and Mike did the reboot um, or started in, in 2008 or, or so, uh, that was done in Adobe Air. Uh, and, you know, at the time that seemed like the right technology, um, especially, you know, uh, given portability between different computers and environments. Um, today, you know, really the game engine market has matured quite a bit and, um, you know, the, it's down to a few major game engines if you want to have flexibility uh, in, in where you release. And um, we actually haven't fully decided the final list of platforms. Um, we're fairly confident in releasing a Steam version later this year, but we want to keep our options open for doing even a console version or, you know, uh, for, for phones or, or, you know, mobile devices. 
And so uh, one of the things that's great about Unity is that um, it is one of these environments that's, you know, write once, right. test everywhere. When it, all, when it all works, you know, you click and deploy, uh, it, it can that's be right. impressive. Right. For people who do want to follow this project, uh, do you want to mention your URL? And I'll put it on screen as well. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, yes, you can find everything about our project on our website, chipwits.com. Uh, and in particular, we're trying to build our mailing list there. So for anyone who wants to follow the game, you know, week by week as we develop it, uh, you can subscribe to our mailing list. Just click the sign up button on the top. Uh, we're trying to get uh, a, a list of people who are interested enough in the game that they might want to indulge us in beta testing. Uh, so if you may be interested in beta testing, please join our mailing list. Uh, and, you know, you can also follow us on Twitter uh, and Mastodon. Uh, we'll, we'll have our links there, but it's Chipwits Inc. for Twitter and Chipwits at Mastodon.social for Mastodon. The number of people that actually had computers in 1983, 1982, 1984, mm -hmm by today's standards was vanishingly small. Right. And so right. this is my question to you. What was it like being, uh, you know, I don't want to puff you up by using the word pioneer, but you essentially were. What was it like, you know, writing games, porting games, trying to make money in a market where there, there really weren't even enough people to sell anything to? Right. Uh, it was, it was, we... Well, I'll use the term pioneer because it was rough at times, you know, uh, we, we took some arrows, but um, we, we, we knew we had something good. So we were almost arrogant in approaching publishers. It was like, you know, what can you do with for us? <laughs> and uh, we actually had uh, an agent who, who represented us. Um, but some funny things about coding in that time and the scarcity of computers was you know, when people ask me what I did for a living, and I'd say, well, I write computer games. And I help about 80% of people would sort of give me a funny look. And the other 20% were like, you How know, do I do that? asking questions. And, you know, I have a great idea for a game if you just program it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, people didn't even know that was a job, a lot of people at that time. Okay. Now, now, running the original Chipwits, mm -hmm. It's a bit of a it's a bit of a journey. It can be done, right? Yeah. Uh, but unlike many games from that era, it was very hardware dependent. Like if you have an emulator that is not like bit for bit perfect of the 128k Mac, it might not run. Yeah, yeah. No, I I I I I've run it in emulators a few times, and um, you know I, I understand. I I wasn't. I was trying to obey the Mac rules, um, but they were very hazy at that time. I mean, I had two notebooks full of the original Mac documentation, and I learned just a little bit enough to do what I needed to do. Uh, but of course, the Mac itself was a little. You know, it, it could be flaky at the time, and then the Mac fourth language was was not perfect. So, you know, a lot of factors uh, there. I mean, obviously, my coding was perfect. So, you know, of course, of course, the fourth <laughs> On the Commodore. I was doing some low level stuff that I'm sure. I mean, like writing to sectors of disks and things like that. that uh, yeah. The, the the other thing that is interesting to me when I go back and, and look at that era, you know, occasionally you look at Byte Magazine or whatever, is how open, how really wide open the language space, the programming language space was, right? And it's hard to even remember because I lived through the 90s when C ate the world and, right. you know, to some extent C++. And then in the 2000s, JavaScript really ate the world. And that kind of in the 2010s, Python has eaten the world. It's hard to even remember a time when it would have been a question what you might right. do. The fourth guys in the 80s were absolutely positive, like this is the stuff, this is this is the future that we're using, and everyone using you know Pascal or C or whatever, they just don't get it. Um, mm -hmm. Did you did you really drink the fourth Kool Aid, or was it very? In your blog article, you talk about Mac fourth being essentially an end run around kind of the expensive development environments that you would yes. have otherwise needed. Um, 
the approved Apple way of developing for the Mac at first was to buy a 10,000 buck Lisa, which is like 25,000 bucks in today's bucks. And so we didn't, we were, we had money, but not that money. Plus we'd heard about this Mac fourth. I had been, I had already had a year of, of, of fourth. I, I drank the Kool-Aid pretty deeply and uh, it, it paid off. I mean, uh, simple language, it, it got ported to Commodore, got ported to Apple too. And like I said, about 70% of the code was, was straight. You know, I'm, I, yeah, that's my estimate right now. So uh, we mentioned briefly copy protection and back in the eighties, that was a real thing. And the, the first time I, I ever saw uh, Chipwitz, Mike and I were at some wall, mall and there was a Mac in the window, you know, which was a rarity, one of the, the original Macs. And there was Chipwitz playing, you know, in a track mode for the crowd. And so we went into the store, you know, just, oh, man, this is great. Mm-hmm. And the store owner was abashed, you know, yeah. uh, we, you know. It was a it was a pirated copy that oh, yeah. he was showing. <laughs> so yeah, the first time I saw it in the wild, it was a stolen copy. I'm sure. I don't remember for 100 percent that the version I saw was pirated, but that mm-hmm. was that was kind of the norm back then. And oh, yeah. there was no, including from me. You know, every time I have a developer from the 1980s on, like. You know, a conversation I have to have is, let me apologize to you for stealing your game when I was 11 years old. And it was a thing that was done. Um, and it's a thing that as an adult, as a, you know, comparatively old man now, I feel very bad about because of that issue we talked about before with how few people existed to buy these games. Yeah. Let me throw this question out to either of you or both of you. Um, obviously, you want Chipwits 2023. I don't, I'll just call it Chipwits. Um, you want it to be a success. You want people to use the product, play the product, enjoy the, enjoy, play the game, enjoy the game. Um, beyond that benchmark of, you know, yes, people are using the thing we made and liking it. Is there something you hope they get out of it? Yeah, I mean, I guess um, this is a passion project for everyone involved. And, and we should mention that uh, aside from Doug and myself, we have two other team members, uh, you know, one one who's another coder on the project and one who's a, a, a music uh, a composer. And uh, you can find all the information about them on our website. Uh, but yeah, uh, for all of us, this is a passion project and, and, you know, we just love the game so much. We want to make sure that it survives and that it, it, you know, reaches a whole nother generation of fans. So, you know, I mean, there's, there's one part here, which is just, you know, can we keep the game going? And for me, I guess the other part is I, I had the pleasure of working with, um, with Mitch Resnick at the MIT media lab, mm-hmm. uh, on porting scratch junior to the Android tablet. Right. Uh, and, during that work, I got to talk to Mitch a lot. And, um, he, uh, himself, he, his mentor was uh, Seymour Papert, I Mm -hmm. believe is his name. And, uh, who who was one of the creators of logo. And, um, as as soon as I learned a lot more about the philosophy, he had this sort of, you know, constructionism, I think it was called philosophy of, you know, the way that the best way to learn is not by just being a, a recipient of information from other people, but to actually, you know, create and, and, you know, make things and use the knowledge you already have to sort of build new things. And, and that's a real way to learn. And so I, I really identify with that, you know, and, and I remember creating Chipwits when I was younger, uh, you know, creating these robots and, and, you know, plugging chips into its brain. Uh, just the experimental feel of that was helping me learn and really understand concepts at a very deep level. Um, so I, what I would hope is actually that people don't just play the game, but they actually use it as a way to create and to learn. And so, you know, the, the first version of this, we're, we're aiming to just, you know, um, make, make it very approachable. There are these concepts that also seem are peppered put forth, which is like this idea of a low threshold, high ceiling. Uh-huh. And the, the low threshold being that it should be something that's very easy to enter. You don't need to learn a lot to 
you know, to, to use it. And the high ceiling being that, you know, you, you may start building very simple things, but eventually you create more and more intricate creations and you should set the ceiling high enough so that you actually have a space. And Mitch Resnick added this idea of wide walls to this when he created Scratch, right. which is the idea that you, you want to be able to get to that um, high ceiling with many different paths and, and applying it to different domains like robotics and, and whatever else. And so what I'd really like to do is, is um, can, you know, assuming we can get successful adoption of the game, I really think it's about the community, you know, really building a, a thriving community around the game who are uh, using it as a, as a vessel to create and explore and, and learn new things. And if we can accomplish that, you know, I think we've really taken the spirit of the game, you know, in, into this um, new generation of fans. What should I have asked you that I did not ask you? Well, actually, there's one thing about Eyeball, I think, you know, the, the language, since your channel is about programming languages, um, I, th I figure one thing that's interesting to note about Eyeball, which is the, the visual language you use in Chiplets to program the robot, uh, is that there, there is no way to get a compile error, right? Like this, this language is any, any valid, you know, any program you write is valid. Any graph and transition is sensible in some sense? I didn't say sensible. <laughs> it's <laughs> valid, right? And so it may do very surprising things, but that's part of the joy of playing the game. And, and one thing I really appreciate about Eyeball is that um, it actually has these built-in constraints, given that it is programmed on a grid um, that has a fixed width and a fixed height and a fixed number of subpanels. Mm -hmm. um, you actually get this taste even if you're not a programmer, you get this taste of what it's like to build within engineering constraints, right? You, you know, building with limited memory or with a specific shape, mm -hmm. you know, of your memory. And this is something that I think is fairly, you know, unique about, about chiplets. Um, and, you know, the, the fact that it combines, it, it, it actually goes fairly deep as well. You know, if you look at eyeball as a language, it introduces stack oriented concepts. Um, which, you know, if you, if you look at a lot of coding games, they don't really get that far. Usually they, they teach sequencing and, mm -hmm. and some, and maybe some, some subroutines, things like that. Yeah. But, um, it's pretty rare to see things like stacks and, and so forth. And in, in we were very proud that you never get an error message running, running a, you know, chiplets program that, that they all work. Once we came up with the idea that a blank chip meant return, you know, good. That solved a lot of problems. I'd, I'd love to thank you for your time. Um, Doug, Mark, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Enjoyable and, and uh, yeah, really urge your, your uh, subscribers to check us out on chipwits.com. For Thanks. a message for my subscribers, I cannot put claims on Doug's and Mark's time, but if you do ask a question in the comment below, I will communicate it to them and uh, maybe we'll, we'll get an answer uh, in the comments. Thank you so much. This has been Programming Like It's 1979.